So focusing on the golden hour, because there is so much of science in that one hour, what is happening in that hour. So I'm going to discuss that. And if I have some time, then I'll go more into nutrition aspect uh, of six months and above. But let's just focus on, uh, you know, uh, first golden hour. So what happens, we know about a thousand days, right? So thousand days, so out of thousand days, your 270 days are basically your pregnancy. Correct. So in that pregnancy time, you know, mother probably uh, has nutritionist, mother has uh, access to OBGYN doctors or whoever, any doctor that takes care of a pregnancy part, right? While pediatrician and nutritionist, they take care of the rest of the 730 days, right? So once a baby is born, uh, that's when the pediatrician and the again, the nutritionist come in in the picture. Now, there is an overlap of about an hour, okay? What is that hour? As soon as child is born, Okay, and when the pediatrician is called in the delivery room uh, to take care of the baby's uh, initial, uh, you know, uh, important time, you have OBGYN in the room, you have pediatrician in the room, and you have that, uh, you know, uh, support which has which has been given by nutritionist to the mother during ANC. So she has that knowledge, right? So with three of three of us, you know, we can basically influence at lifelong health. In a sense, for example, when we have birthday party, right? When child is born, child has first birthday party, second birthday party, and we we kind of always, uh, you know, arrange so much. We spend so much time uh, making all this, uh, you know, uh, you know, planning your uh, birthday cake, planning food, planning party for birthdays, right? Think about it. You're bringing this newborn, okay? And the first hour, you have this beautiful baby born in uh, in your in your hospital or in your phc and you you have to celebrate it and the way you celebrate it is by giving okay what you're giving to the child you're giving the perfect start how are you how are you giving the perfect start is basically as soon as baby is born you're putting the child to mother's mother's uh, breast and that is called your basically breast crawl or skin to skin attachment because that is going to give the perfect start and you're giving that perfect gift to that baby and it's lifelong and let's see why it is lifelong and that's why it's called golden hour because you know you that hour will never come back and the time lost in this one hour you will never get it back and it has a lifelong implications on child's health and of course there are a lot breast milk has i mean there is a whole science to it uh, in its optimum nutrition, it has bioactive component, it has host defense, uh, defense protein. But what I'm going to focus on is base, basically it is an important source of commensal bacteria for gut, gut colonization. Okay, so what happens when the baby is born? Okay, the baby has a little bit of bacteria, uh, which is coming on from amniotic fluid, you know, from mother's womb. And then when baby is, baby is pretty much has a little bit, but it's pretty much sterile. Okay, so now let's happen. Well, let's see what happens when the baby is sterile. So here, this uh, uh, this is a gut microbiome with breast milk. Uh, we'll go a little bit more detail in exactly what happens in baby's gut. Uh, you know, when the colostrum passes on. So here is basically kind of a you know electromicroscopic picture of your uh, my, you know gut bacteria. Uh, extremely small and you will be amazed to understand uh, gut microbiome and it's 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 like the whole world you know in human body uh, i'm going to focus on of course just babies uh, how many bacteria per ml of breast milk uh, 10000 sick cells per ml okay and 7 to 8 billion bacterial cells each day which are formed in the gut uh, what is the function of gut microbiome? So these are the gut microbiome which are being developed in baby uh, because baby is uh, getting um, breast milk, okay? So what it does, it basically, this microbiome, uh, it metabolizes the polysaccharide, which are basically, uh, you know, your uh, oligosaccharides which are present in the milk and results in synthesis of, uh, you know, short chain fatty acids. Those are basically essential fatty acids. You guys know uh, so short chain fatty acids, which are rich source of uh, energy for the host. And uh, basically it also involves in synthesis of vitamin K. It is important for... Uh, 
uh, formation of components of vitamin B, B. We also know B12, uh, you know, a lot of this gut bacteria kind of uh, releases B12. It, uh, it is also important for conversion of glutamine. Now, glutamine is basically a amino acid. It is important. This, this particular uh, information is very important because there are new hypotheses coming in where uh, what they are saying is basically gut microbiome of the mother and the baby is also probably related uh, to uh, aut uh, you know autism you know autism spectrum disorder and autism rate is really going up especially in america and it's going up in in india too and probably they are thinking of uh, this could be the reason of conversion of so uh, children who have uh, you know autism they have decreased conversion from glutamine to gaba gaba is a neurotransmitter which is important in your brain okay and then also gut microbiome is very important for a breakdown of various polyphenols now as nutritionists we all know that these polyphenols are so important you know we get it from uh, fruits from vegetables from uh, green tea and so many other uh, you know amazing uh, vegetables and fruits but unfortunately you know, if you have a good microbiome it's going to help you to break down these polyphenols okay um, another thing, uh, microbiome is also important for detoxifying toxic products, and it also has effect on drug metabolism. So, for example, if child is taking any uh, medication uh, for any reason, then uh, basically the 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 microbiome in baby's gut will will uh, will have an effect on your drug metabolism. So we have to basically, uh, you know, we have to change the dosage uh, depending upon uh, basically gut microbiome. Uh, also, which is one thing which is extremely important is your maintenance of structural integrity. So uh, again, I'm going to explain a little bit more detail that what is the structural integrity of gut mucosal barrier because um, uh, gut is basically your. Uh, there's one thing which is completely open to outside is your gut. Another one is your nose and your mouth, but mainly your intestine is completely open to outside. Outside, so whatever you're eating, basically, if you, if you don't have a proper gut integrity, if you don't have proper uh, uh, maintenance of those gut uh, cells, then anything can get absorbed into your uh, vascular system, in, into your, your blood vessels, right? So, uh, gut microbiome is extremely important for integrity of this gut, gut mucosal barrier. Okay, and it also serves as a barrier. So it basically causes, uh, again, I'm going to go a little bit detail about it, how it causes barrier against all the pathogenic bacteria and viruses, not only bacteria, but a lot of other uh, you know, my, microorganisms. And it also important for development of host immune system. So look at all these effects that gut microbiome has. So you want to have perfect gut microbiome for that baby who is just born, because there are all these effects that baby is going to have. Um, again, we want to find out okay, how, where do those gut microbiome come from? What are the sources of this microbiome? Because we want to have perfect one. So we want to have, it's like giving a perfect cake and perfect ingredients, right? So we want to have a perfect, uh, you know, uh, chain of events. The child gets a perfect start in, in, in her life. All right. So microbiota comes from amniotic fluid. It comes from meconium, basically, you know, uh, and meconium uh, originates from uterus. So meconium is basically, you know, a lot of time when the baby is born, uh, you know, when they pass stool, you will see that the green uh, liquidy stuff that they pass in the stool, uh, that is called meconium, right? So it's, um, uh, they can get those microbacteria from meconium. Uh, it also comes from maternal vagina extremely important this is really really important uh, to have a basically vaginal birth you know to get again the perfect uh, gut microbiome another time uh, sometime it also comes from maternal feces uh, it comes from uh, skin it comes from breast milk and it comes from surrounding okay so we want to have surrounding as clean as possible and uh, all these other factors are extremely important because it's going to give them uh, mother's uh, gut microbiome Okay, so externally, uh, from it can come from baby's mouth. So what happens is when the baby is sucking on uh, uh, breast, the areola, uh, the the uh, bacteria which are present in baby's saliva, it can go back into uh, you know uh, in the duct, collecting duct, and it can go back uh, you know in the memory duct, and that can basically uh, create a lot of this uh, uh, reaction, uh, and then it will uh, basically go back. 
to a baby. So that is, again, it's really another important source of uh, microbacteria in uh, mother's milk. And another way which uh, uh, some of the studies have found is what happens when uh, there is a, a translocation of bacteria in mother's gut. So for example, uh, mother's gut has say some of the good bacteria which can get trans, uh, which can go through a special pathway to mother's memory gland. Can you imagine this is such a beautiful way of nature's uh, helping that baby to give the perfect microorganism from mother to baby. Okay, so this I will again uh, discuss a little bit about the dendritic cells. So what are the dendritic cells? Okay, and these are the organisms which are found. Uh, these are some of the organisms which are found in breast milk. These are some of the organisms which are found in areola skin. And these are some of the organisms which are found in infant stool. So look at, let's look at what, what is found in uh, breast milk. So if you look at this uh, pink color, or, uh, color over here, pink colors are mainly a proteobacteria. So basically breast milk, this was one of the study which was done by uh, uh, Dr. Pannaraj. Okay, so in, in that, what he found is that mother's milk had a lot of this, uh, you know, proteobacteria. Uh, areola skin, so mother's areola skin had all the skin bacteria. So skin bacteria are called your firmicutes. So what are your firmicutes bacteria? Your staphylococcus, your streptococcus, those are all your, basically by and large, your skin bacteria. But if you look at infant stool, the infant stool had a lot more actinobacteria. So actinobacteria is your bifidobacteria. These are all basically your species of bacteria. So why, why do you think the infant stool has a lot more this bacteria? Although, although breast milk has proteobacteria, but what happened in the uh, in baby's uh, gut that the infant stool has a lot more uh, bifidobacteria? And that is because, again, this is, uh, I'm again going to go a little bit more in detail to understand exactly what happens in baby's gut. Okay, now these are all the different kind of uh, bacteria that you see in children, baby's gut, uh, and they all are different. So if you look at uh, babies who are born by vagina, okay, so vaginal delivery babies, they have much higher level of uh, species like lactobacillus, Provotella, Snedia, these are some of the very good bacteria which are very important, uh, uh, you know, in babies. And babies who are born vaginally, they have this really good bacteria. Now, babies who are born by cesarean, they have different kind of bacteria. So if you look at, their, uh, you know, uh, in their gut microbiome, they will have more of staphylococcus, again, because the skin is cut, right? So you will have a lot more of this uh, staphylococcus, corine bacterium, propionobacterium. Those are the bacteria that you see in babies who have c -section. And the babies who are formula fed, now those formula fed babies have completely different bacteria. So they will have more of a bacteroids, clostridium, you know, a lot of this other, more of a pathogenic bacteria, which will cause a lot more problems. So you will know like, you know, a lot of time when we give formula, you know, and those babies are crying a lot, they may have a lot more gas, they have a lot more bloating. It's because their bacteria are completely uh, gone haywire, right? And mothers who get antibiotics, so babies who get antibiotics, you know, or during delivery, pre-delivery, those babies have different bacteria. So look at the bacteria change in different bacteria, right? Uh, and also, when you're weaning the child, when you're starting the complementary food, you know, depending upon what kind of food you are starting, you know, they, children will have different bacteria. So these are the bacteria where a child is given a lot more high fiber food, they will have uh, more of Provotella, Versus, versus children who are given a lot more, you know, uh, uh, like a high fat animal protein diet, they'll have a bacteria. So they'll have a different bacteria. So basically your bacteria will change. And by and large, by three years of age, you know, uh, children's bacteria is pretty much similar to your adult uh, gut bacteria. Okay, now let's see what happens now, how the nature kind of prepares this baby to come on the planet Earth. Okay, so let's see how the mucosal immune defense uh, develops. So here, so this is basically baby's intestine, okay? This is the intestinal wall, okay? Now here, what the first thing what uh, uh, we have in our intestinal gut cell lining, this is the M cells, M cells. It looks like M, right? So this is important, this are M cells. Uh, then you have something called, this are all uh, Peyer's patch. 
so these are your lymphoid pears patch number two these are your pears patches you have basically your uh, t cells your b cells these are all your you know your uh, cells basically you know your immunological cells right then you have your third one is a lamina propria this was your you know basically cells which are present um, uh, just outside the cellular this thing and they they again have a lot of this plasma cells they have the cd4 t cells you know uh, again those are all the immunological cells and then you have uh, intrapital lymphocytes so these are your intrapital lymphocytes so these are all these cells are extremely important you know to basically uh, start the immune function because babies absolutely imagine baby was in mother's womb you know baby was protected by mother's immunity right now baby's out baby has to function on his own so baby requires that little bit of stimulation you know to to have the immune function stim stimulated right it's just like for example we, if we get say viral load of covid right that's when what's going to happen suppose if you if you if you are exposed to somebody who has covid what's going to happen in the body your body is going to react right now here is a foreign virus coming to into your body your body's immune function is going to start reacting very fast right it will start increasing your t cells your b cells all this you know you must be understanding all the cytokines and all this levels go up right exactly similar way when the baby is out from mother's womb you know baby is now preparing or nature is preparing baby for that immunity right now to to increase that immunity basically baby will require that stimulus baby will require something which will basically tell body okay you start immune function and protect this baby okay so this is what it is now again going back a little bit more into science so what happens uh, so once the baby takes this back uh, this uh, milk mother's milk which has uh, mother's good bacteria so those bacteria has a effect on uh, this columnar epithelial cells so the one which i showed you over here so how it affects the columnar epithelial cells this is this is the slide over here so what it does so first thing what it does it basically uh, creates this microvilli so do you see this microvilli over here this are columnar epithelial cells this is the gut lining this is our lining okay this is basically your lumen this is your gut lumen this is where the milk comes in okay and this is your uh, basically uh, just underlying uh just underlying the gut cells your columnar cells you have lot of this immune cells over here okay so this all these immune cells are waiting for something to stimulate them so they can start acting up right so the first thing what uh, uh, you know the bacteria in mother's milk which it does it it tells columnar epithelial cells to basically have a microvilli extension so here this is this is important the microvilli extension it is not only important for absorption of your lot of nutrients as you guys know but uh, it has other functions also second thing what it does normally kya hota hai ki when you have this columnar epithelial cells right these are all the cells normally in the newborn fresh newborn there is some gap in between this uh, uh, columnar epithelial cells so they are not attached to it there is no adhesion there is little bit of gap so now you have this suppose you have a gap so anything that you put in the mouth you know lot of things which should not get absorbed from that food that you're eating it will get absorbed because then you have you have this gap but thanks to bacteria in mother's milk immediately that gap becomes sealed so do you see there is a seal so it it seals them so this is the first level of defense it's like literally uh, you know your soldiers coming one close to one another and saying no we will not let you in right so this is the second level first level of defense the second level of defense what it does basically it tells a lot of the cells like there are different cells in your columnar epithelial cells you must have already known this you know there are penet cells there are goblet cells there are all the different cells right so what it's going to tell all the cells to start producing something called glycocalyx also called mucin okay mucin like a mucus layer so now it has this beautiful mucus level all over the columnar epithelial cells this is your second level because what happens basically it will be very difficult for any bad bacteria to go into the epithelial cells you don't want any bad bacteria so this is a second level of defense where basically you know it will not allow anything to enter your uh, columnar epithelial cells right third thing what the bacteria will do it will basically uh, cause a stimulation of this peptides okay this pep peptides are basically formed from your amino acids as you know right and then what we will do it will basically those peptides are very important for as an antimicrobial uh, effect so it will it has an antimicrobial effect uh, fourth thing what it will do basically 
uh, it so do you see this area this is do you remember that we spoke about m cells there are m cells right and i told you to remember those m cells now there is one particular area in your intestine and baby's intestine where basically there is no mucus production there is no mucin there is no microvilli why do we have that because it's important for for this immune cells to get exposed to mother's bacteria right so if you have everything covered you will not have stimulation of the immune cells so here this m cells will allow basically your good bacteria and your bad bacteria to enter the intestinal wall and then basically it 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 will stimulate all your cells underneath right so this is important now one more thing which is really important is your dc this is basically your dendritic cells remember we i talked about dendritic cells so dendritic cells are special cells and what it does it basically kind of uh, you know attaches the good bacteria probably like a commensal bacteria and then it takes it inside and then basically exposes all these other cells to those bacteria right so this is another very specialized dendritic cell so this is this is the basis of your immunity that how now let's see what happens when you know mother's milk comes in right now this is the beautiful picture that i found from one of the study that i was reading uh, and it's the electron microscope of the microvilli so this is your columnar epithelial cells okay this is the cell and this are all the microvilli right this beautiful picture okay so now what happens now let's see how the immunity develops okay so here i discussed about those columnar epithelial cells right this is your dendritic cells right so what it is doing it is basically taking all these bacteria and it is bringing bringing into sub epithelial area right there where, where you have those uh, lymphocyte cells now normally what happens initially you have this uh, t helper cells which are nice cells nice cells means they are not exposed okay and then uh, normally kya hota hai ki you have uh, this uh, there are different t cells or nice cells are basically get trans uh, converted into your t helper 1 cells t helper 2 cells t regulatory cells these are basically so it starts stim stimulating right and normally babies born with lot of th uh, th2 cells so here this here if you look at it where is my plus yeah so basically normally they have predominance of this this cells why because there should not be any rejection when the baby is developing in mother's womb there should not be any rejection so to so not to have a rejection uh, basically nature what nature has done there is predominance of th2 cells so there is no rejection but once the baby is born now baby is out of mother's womb Uh, there has to be regulation so you can't have th2 th2 uh, uh, like dominance otherwise child will have lot of autoimmune diseases lot of uh, allergies so what it has to do it has, it has to basically uh, you know make uh, basically uh, balance all this uh, th cells okay and another thing what it does uh, again you know it also takes uh, this bacteria to your b cells okay now what is the function of b cells b cells are important for your uh, iga right so what happens basically the iga gets secreted and that iga helps with uh, you know it contains bacterial attachment and penetration so your secretory iga is extremely important and i just read a paper yesterday where they found that children who like younger children the reason they are not getting covid infection because they have very high level of secretory iga which prevents the attachment of bacteria and virus to your cells to your uh, to your the cells right so that's why it's important that children get the right uh, you know and obviously you want mother's bacteria to stimulate all this uh, all the cells you don't want cow milk or formula to stimulate all the cells right okay so now there is another very beautiful uh, presentation on development of immune tolerance what about immune tolerance means suppose if you if you exposed to any allergens right so it could be allergens to any food any al like allergens you have to develop that immunity so that you don't uh, have those reaction imagine if somebody had anything in their had allergic reaction right so this that's called basically immune tolerance 
right? So here again, uh, talking a little bit about science, because this is again, I, I find it extremely important uh, and very interesting also. So if you, if you look at it, I spoke about the DC, which is your dendritic cells, right? So, uh, and this is mother's milk. So mother's milk have your microbiota. So I, I spoke about all the bacteria that it has. I also spoke about uh, some of this uh, microbial pr proliferation. So it has human milk olig oligosaccharide, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And it has a lot of these other antimicrobials, right? So all they all kind of work in synergy, okay? And then basically it helps uh, in prevention of allergies. So let's see what it does. So, so any antigen is basically taken up by your uh, dendritic cell, okay? And it basically is taken to lymph node Remember, I told you that it, take, it, it takes those uh, bacterial cells to those uh, lymph nodes and those cells, and it stimulates your, uh, you know, uh, transforming growth factor, which basically induces, remember I told you about, again, the knife cells changing into T regular, all that. So this is, this is one reaction which is happening, you know, when mother's milk is going in, right? Second reaction, what is happening? There is something called interleukin-22. Okay, this are, again, you must have read a lot about COVID, you must have read about a lot of this, uh, you know, interleukins and cytokines and all that. So, of course, you don't want too much of cytokines, but, uh, you know, you need some amount of cytokine to fight your infections, right? So, another thing what happens is there is, uh, there is a production of the interleukin-22, okay? Uh, and th that interleukin-22 is extremely important. Why is it important? because it, it is important for formation of this peptide. So remember I spoke about the peptide as it produces this peptide, okay? And this peptide production results in your uh, uh, making of your uh, mucin production, you know, the, the lining of the gut, you know? So for that, uh, interleukin-22 is very important, okay? And that is basically, it is important for strengthening of gut barrier, okay? Uh, third thing, what it does, basically, uh, this particular gut barrier, you know, the mucin will prevent the transfer of dietary antigen across the barrier. So then you will have this beautiful layer, it will not allow any antigen to enter, okay? And for that, you need that interleukin-22, which will stimulate your goblet cells, it will stimulate your panic cells, and it will, it will produce your, you know, mucin production. Then there is another enzyme, Okay, there's an enzyme, basically, uh, uh, it's called indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase. So there is a, we call it IDO, okay? Uh, I know I'm going a little bit too into detail, but this are, I think, a really interesting topic that we have to, if we, if we understand, we will never let child have anything but cholesterol, that too within half an hour, okay? So there is an enzyme called IDO, and which get activated in response of allergen. So if there is an exposure to any allergen, this IDO gets uh, activated. Okay, and then what, what does IDO do? It metabolizes, there is a, a few, I mean, of course, you guys know tryptophan, right? That's like another uh, amino acid. So what it does, it basically converts your tryptophan to kynurenin, okay, and which has the tolerogenic effect. So again, basically, this kynurenin uh, is extremely important in baby, and that will prevent basically any uh, immune reaction. Okay, and uh, what it does, it again, basically kind of uh, uh, affects your T regs. Okay, and this is how it's going to prevent allergy. So these are few of the components which are important in prevention of allergy development. Okay, and being a nutritionist, we guys know that, you know, it's so, I mean, a lot of time people have so many allergies. And now when you ask them, do ask them one question. Ask them that when you were born, where, where, in how much time did you get mother's milk? Whether did you get mother's milk or did you, did you not get mother's milk? If you did not get mother's milk, what did you get? All this thing, if you ask the question in a lot of people who have allergies, by and large, you'll get the answer that they were not fed, you know, uh, colostrum right away. Okay. Uh, another science which is coming up is your microbiome, gut and brain access. Okay. So uh, what happens uh, basically, uh, Again, you know, you, you must have uh, kind of uh, studied in uh, your uh, uh, nutrition that sometime when we are very stressed, right? When you are extremely uh, worried if we have exams, you know, a lot of time we have stomach pain, we have diarrhea, we have like nausea-like feeling. Why do, they ha why do we have that, right? Think about it. So, I mean, basically, of course, there is an autonomic, uh, autonomic, autonomous nervous system, you have vagal, uh, simple, uh, vagal nerves, you have all this basically uh, connection between gut and uh, your brain, right? So it's similarly, when you have basically issue with gut 
you know, uh, through a lot of this uh, uh, nervous connection, you know, especially vagal nerve, you know, a lot of metabolite of uh, gut microbiome basically can affect brain. So what they are saying in a lot of the research, uh, recent articles, they're saying that if um, uh, there are a lot of neuroimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, uh, Alzheimer's, autism, anxiety, depression, st uh, stress, all this lot of the disease are probably involved because of gut microbiome. I mean, of course, uh, the, nothing is proven as yet, but as more and more studies are coming out, you know, uh, it, it just is amazing. So again, let's see how it functions, okay? So uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's basically like a bi-directional biochemical communication. Remember I spoke about GABA, like how, uh, you know, your uh, gut microbiome is important for formation of GABA. It is also important for formation of serotonin. Now, if, if you remember, serotonin is another neurotransmitter. It's important for happiness, right? If you have a low serotonin, you will be depressed, you'll be sad. So it's really important to have this really, uh, you know, important, uh, uh, my, you know, your neurotransmitter, serotonin, right? And basically, uh, so your gut microbiome influences all this production, expression of all these important neurotransmitters. So imagine if you don't have, you will have, uh, of course, you will have some neurological issues right? Uh, this one is also important. Remember, I mentioned about the intestinal barrier and tight junction. So if you don't have those tight junction, basically a lot of this toxic metabolite can pass through uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and cause issues, okay? Uh, another important thing about uh, short-chain fatty acids. So again, you know, as I mentioned, short-chain fatty acids, serotonin, kynurin, they all have a, uh, effect on brain. Okay, so think about it when you're putting anything in your mouth. Uh, I'm not talking about babies now, I'm talking about adults. Uh, you don't want to do anything which can affect your microbiome, right? Because it has effect uh, and you will see it, uh, you know, like a lot of time uh, when you eat something, when you have bloating, next morning you will wake up, you'll have headache, you'll have something called brain fog, you know. So you will notice it. Uh, you have to now kind of uh, really, you know, be aware of a lot of the symptoms which you may not realize. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, so again, uh, picture depiction of how the uh, hypothesis of uh, autism and gut dysbiosis. Again, nothing is proven. This is a hypothesis, but this was another very good, beautiful article uh, that I had just read uh, two, three days ago. And this is again, you know, this is the altered gut microbiome, you know, and mothers and babies. And then basically it affects uh, ba uh, your brain, you know, through various signals, various pathways. <clears throat> okay, now another thing which is really important is uh, all these bacterial cells that we have, okay, in our gut. So we, we live in harmony, okay? When we have good bacteria, we have good immunity because it's going to protect us, okay? When we have good immunity, we'll have a better bacteria. And those bacteria will, so it's like, a, it's like a full synergy, right? When you have a dysbiosis, Dysbiosis means you your commensal bacteria are lower and your pathogenic bacteria are higher, right? So now you will have a lot more of this gut problem of uh, bloating, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea. Then of course you eventually what you're going to develop, you're going to develop a lot of your immune disease because you again your gut lining is not, you know, your gut lining is not uh, well prepared. Uh, it has all these holes. You know, your mucus is not protecting, your mucus level, level is gone, your mucus layer is gone, then a lot of these toxins are getting absorbed, right? And then your body is reacting and you saw there are a lot of these B cells, T cells waiting just underneath your intestinal wall, you know, uh, to react, right? So then basically uh, people who have a lot of this gut microbiome problem, they are, risk, uh, they are at risk for atopic uh, dermatitis, they are at risk for food allergies, uh, you know, IBD, necrotizing enterocolitis, which we see in uh, pediatric and uh, in, in ICU, we see it all the time in small babies. Uh, we see necrotizing enterocolitis, we see metabolic syndrome, and we see, like uh, this, you know, there's so much of information out there on gut microbiome and disease, right? But if you have excellent gut bacteria, you're eating right food, you know, babies are getting colostrum, babies getting uh, mother's milk, mo mother is eating right kind of food, then obviously baby will develop immune tolerance, baby will have intestinal homeostasis, there'll be healthy metabolism, right? So it's basically like a win-win situation. And it's very important to keep ourselves in a synergy with our gut microbiome, 
right? Now let's see what affects gut bacteria. Now I spoke a lot about what exactly it does in the body. We want to make sure that we protect it, right? So in babies, how will you protect those gut bacteria? You want to have a positive, so green, all your green factors are your positive factors. So you want to have a proper vaginal delivery as much as possible. Of course, maybe 15% of the time, mother may need cesarean section, which is okay. But, you know, I, I see that uh, most of the time, like almost just the other day, there was a, a news that 57% uh, patients in private get a cesarean section. So, you know, you want to ask gynecologist why I'm getting cesarean section. So just kind of be on top of it and try to get as much as possible vaginal delivery. Okay, if there are complications, obviously there is no choice. Then you want to have as much as possible term delivery because babies who are born premature have a different gut microbiome bacteria, right? Then you want to have skin to skin touch, skin to skin attachment, breastfeeding right away within as soon as possible, you know, if possible, as just dry the baby and put the baby. We have a beautiful video on spoken tutorial. You want to avoid antibiotic as much as possible. So what antibiotic in mothers, avoid antibiotics in babies, you know, uh, what will alter this gut bacteria? Cesarean delivery, okay, preterm delivery, early bath, okay, lack of skin to skin contact, formula feeding, and antibiotic exposure. So, formula feeding also includes cow's milk, okay. So, any milk other than mother's milk uh, will create a problem in gut bacteria. And if there is antibiotic ex exposure, so you want to prevent uh, all this as much as possible, okay. This are again some of the other uh, factors which can uh, create, uh, you know, gut disruption and causing, you know, asthma, atopy, diabetes, all that. Um, of course, later on, diet is also very important. So child may have perfect nutrition for six months and then they continue breastfeeding for two, three years. But if they start, you know, food, which is uh, which can be damaging to gut micro microbacteria, and some of them are like sugar, you know, jaggery, omega-6 loaded uh, fatty acids, a lot of this are trans fat, a lot of these things are very uh, detrimental to our gut microbiome. So we have to be very careful what we are putting in our uh, stomach. Okay, this is another one, another article which just came out uh, uh, just a few months ago. And what they found is a lot of time, you know, when mothers come to us, uh, they said, can I, can I get a pump? Can I just pump the milk and give the baby through vati, a chamach, a bottle? So in this study, what they found is mothers who had who were pumping their milk and giving the uh, milk through bottle, those baby had different microbiota than the mothers who were directly attaching. So remember I told you when you have a direct attachment, uh, that areola uh, microbacteria, you know, areola bacteria is also very important. So those bacteria were not giving going in mother's milk and also what was happening, basically there was probably a lot of contamination of uh, breast pumps. So however hard you try to clean it, it's not direct mother's milk going into baby. You know, so those babies had uh, different gut bacteria. So th this is important to understand. Uh, so, and what is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis, as I said, is basically, you know, uh, when there is a symbiotic rel relationship is lost, that's when it's dysbiosis. It means you have a lot more pathogenic bacteria than your normal uh, good bacteria. And what are the implications? Though these are the studies which have, which have been done so far. So again, uh, high risk of infections, asthma, uh, uh, celiac disease, again, you know, uh, very good study which came out, uh, almost 30 to 40% reduction of celiac disease in mothers, uh, babies who got mother's milk, okay? So it, it decreases the, uh, you know, prevalence of celiac disease also. Uh, your, uh, you know, IBD, autoimmune diseases, uh, your irritable bowel syndrome, IBD is inflammatory bowel diseases, obesity, look at this, all this. You know, so many. And this one is the new, really, too much going on in this arena of neuros, uh, neurodegenerative disorders and your mental disorders, right? So autism, stress, depression, schizophrenia, Parkinson's. So if you get chance, you do do uh, kind of uh, reading on this articles on gut microbiome and, you know, neuro, neurodegenerative diseases. Now, <clears throat> okay, so now we spoke about bacteria, right? We, we always say, okay, which is a good prebiotic? Which is a good prebiotic? What should I do for my gut? But you won't believe it. As God has given beautiful bacteria in mother's milk, God has given food for that bacteria. Okay? That is called prebiotic. That's called human milk oligosaccharide. So it's, it's amazing. The nature is just mind-blowing that God has given perfect kind of 
uh, food for those beautiful uh, commensals, like a good bacteria, right? So you guys know about uh, prebiotic definitions. I'm not going to go too much in detail, but basically, you know, uh, those are food for your uh, for bacteria, and basically, it, it uh, you know it it allows the specific changes. It change it basically allows the change in composition and activity of microflora, right? So these are human milk oligosaccharides. Lot of effects on uh, again uh, gut microbiome and also an intestine. Uh, very interesting. So again, I'm going to go a little bit in science. So this is your, uh, you know, uh, your structure of human milk oligosaccharide. Okay. So it has fucose, it has sialic acid, it has N-acetyl glucosamine, galactose, glucose. Right. So this is your structure of HMO. Um, what are they? They are glycans. Okay, uh, they are basically found ab like abundantly in uh, breast milk. Uh, colostrum has high amount. You see, look at this: twenty to twenty-three grams per liter of HMO in uh, your colostrum. It goes down as uh, when when the mother starts getting mature milk, right? Preterm babies have higher amount of uh, uh, HMO. Why? Because that those babies need lot more protection from infection. They need lot more protection from lot more other allergic conditions, right? Because many time what happens, preterm babies, they get formulas, right? And that as soon as we start formulas, uh, especially in, uh, in the US, a uh, lot of these babies, they develop something called necrotizing enterocolitis. So again, I'm going to go a little bit detail in that, see what happens when we start mother, uh, not start mother's milk and start formula. And then what happens to these HMOs, they need to, they have to be resistant to gastric acidity because those are food for microbiota, which are present more in the lower intestine, right? So what it has to, what we, it has to be done is it has to resist to gastric acidity. It has to be prevented from hydrolysis by enzymes, and it has to be prevented from absorption. So it has to go intact lower down in baby's intestine. Right. So when those HMOs reaches the distal small intestine uh, and they end the colon, they are intact and at a very high concentration. OK. And then some of the bacteria, they grow well on this HMO. Some of the bacteria, they don't grow well. OK. And then this bacteria, they produce short chain fatty acids. So remember, I told you about the short chain fatty acids. Those are metabolites. Those are powerful metabolites. OK. And if you uh, read a little bit more about short chain fatty acids, there's like a whole, uh, you know, kind of bunch of 100 papers they will find on effect of short chain fatty acids on, on our body, right? And basically what it does, it favors the growth of commensals over potential pathogens. So it, it allows basically good bacteria to go, grow and it prevents the bad bacteria to kind of die down. Okay, so now again, this are a little bit of science. I'm going to go directly to, uh, I'm going to explain this because this is what uh, I've explained on the previous slide. So what it does, so this HMOs are basically food for good bacteria. So these are your green ones are your good bacteria. Your the, the purple ones are your bad bacteria. So when you have food for good bacteria, and it, it basically bad bacteria does not have HMOs. So they're going to die, right? Without food, they're going to die. So obviously you want uh, mother's uh, milk and baby because if by chance this baby's getting bad bacteria from say, somebody's dirty hand or baby, somebody put, you know, touch the baby or put finger in baby's mouth, you know, all these bacteria which are going in baby's stomach, those are uh, most likely bad bacteria. So if you have a human milk oligosaccharide in mother's milk, basically those bad bacteria will not going to survive. Okay. Second thing, what it does, it basically, uh, it acts like a, a decoy. Decoy means it basically, uh, you know, the, the cells over here, they look like, uh, you know, your epithelial cells over here. So that the, all those bad bacteria get attached over here and then they take it away from uh, columnar epithelial cells, right? So it, it works like a decoy. It basically kind of trick the bad bacteria to go away from your uh, epithelial cells, right? So it does not get absorbed. Then what it does, it causes the cell modulation. So this is where there is an immunomodulation where basically, you know, uh, it allows your plasma cells to produce IgA. So there are a lot of this immuno epigenetic uh, factors that it does. So there's a lot of immunomodulation. I again don't go too much in detail. Okay, this this particular one uh, this I mentioned, okay, babies are born with T helper cell two uh, predominance. Okay, because they don't want to get rejected in baby's mother's womb. But uh, when you have a human milk oligosaccharide, it try to basically, you see how it causes balance. 
So there is a balance of this. Uh, so not only those gut microbiome uh, causing balance, but also human milk oligosaccharide. You know that also causes balance of this TH1 and TH2. This will prevent allergies in future. Extremely important step in baby. Okay. Now this E1. This is what happens. So you remember that we have neutrophils. We have WBC. We have all the cells, right? Those are all uh, cells which kind of comes in when there is an infection, right? But you don't want too much cells going into your cell uh, in your epithelial cells, right? So these are the basically your neutrophils. These are your neutrophils. So what uh, basically HMO does? It prevents the roll. It prevents basically the uh, rolling of uh, the cells on the endothelial cells. So these are your endothelial cells. It's preventing the rolling, right? So when you prevent the rolling, then it will not allow the neutrophils to go into your vascular system. Welcome to the spoken tutorial on the importance of golden R and colostrum feeding. In this tutorial, we will learn about golden R and its importance, benefits of feeding colostrum to the newborn. Let us begin by understanding. What is golden R? Golden R is defined as the first R of the newborn after its birth. This first R is very critical for the child's growth and development. It is also an important factor in a mother's breastfeeding journey. This period helps to strengthen the bond between the mother and her infant. An uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact should be initiated between the two. What is skin-to-skin -skin contact? Skin-to-skin -skin contact is the best way to initiate early breastfeeding. The infant will attempt to crawl and latch on the mother's breast by itself. This is known as breast crawl, which is explained in detail in another tutorial. Next. Let us look at the different stages of breast milk and its composition. The breast milk goes through three main stages. These stages are colostrum, transition milk and mature milk. Each stage is best suited for the changing and growing needs of the baby. We will learn in detail about the first stage which is colostrum. Colostrum is the earliest breast milk produced. It is thick, sticky and concentrated milk. Its color can vary from creamy white to light yellow or dark yellow. It is so precious that it is also known as the liquid gold. Beta carotene present in colostrum is responsible for its yellow color. The breasts begin to produce colostrum in the 12th to 16th week of pregnancy. It starts getting secreted from the breast after delivery. This special milk is secreted only until first 2 to 4 days after delivery. It is secreted in small amounts about 40 to 50 ml only on the first day. This is about 3 tablespoons of milk. Milk starts to be produced in larger amounts between 2 to 4 days. On the third day, the milk supply increases to 300 to 400 ml. This is about 20 to 25 tablespoons of milk. Even though colostrum is secreted in small quantities, it is very nutritious. It is easy to digest which makes it the perfect first food for the infant. It is high in proteins and low in carbohydrates. It is also rich in good fats. These good fats are essential for the growth of the newborn baby. It is also required for proper development of the baby's brain and eyes. Infection-fighting elements are also abundantly present in colostrum. For example, antibodies, lactoferrins, lactadherin and leukocytes. Growth and protective factors are also there. In addition to this, it contains high amounts of vitamin A, E, B12 
and K. A large number of white blood cells are also present in the colostrum. It strengthens the baby's immune system and helps fight disease-causing agents. It contains components which help fight bacteria. Colostrum provides immense benefits to the newborn. Let's look at each benefit one by one. Colostrum is the natural first immunization for the baby. Immediately after birth, the newborn is unable to produce its own antibodies. Feeding colostrum is important as it is particularly rich in antibodies. For example, immunoglobulin A, M and G. Among these, immunoglobulin A, known as IgA, is the most important. They coat the areas of the baby's organs which are prone to infections. For example, lining of the throat, lungs and intestines. IgA binds to the germs and neutralizes them. This prevents the germs from entering the baby's blood. Colostrum helps in regulating the baby's immune system. It balances the levels of T helper cells in their body. An imbalance in T helper cells can result in allergies and autoimmune diseases. In autoimmune diseases, the immune system attacks the healthy cells in the body. More than 70% of our immunity lies in the gut. Colostrum has a huge role to play in the gut health of the infant. It helps in diversifying the baby's gut environment. This helps in prevention of allergies and asthma later in life. It reduces the risk of inflammation of the intestine. The risk of stress and depression is also reduced. Let us understand how colostrum is beneficial for the gut of the baby. A newborn baby is born with a leaky gut. There are gaps between the cells of the inner lining of the intestine. Through these gaps, viruses, bacteria and allergens can enter the baby's body. Colostrum seals these gaps so that no harmful pathogens can pass through. The lining of the cells of the intestine has a brush-like border. This is known as microvilli. Colostrum stimulates the development and extension of these microvilli. This helps in increasing the absorption of nutrients. Colostrum increases release of mucin from the cells of the intestine. Mucin forms a layer on the lining of the intestinal walls. This prevents the entry of any bad bacteria. The colostrum also contains human milk oligosaccharides known as HMO. They act as prebiotics. This means that they promote the growth of good bacteria in the baby's gut. They block the pathogens from attaching to the cells of the intestine. They are also beneficial for the development of the baby's brain. Feeding colostrum to the infant prepares his stomach for digestion. It acts as a laxative to help the baby pass meconium. Meconium is the first dark black or dark green stool of the infant. It gets built up in his bowels during his time in the mother's womb. Passing this meconium early will also help in preventing jaundice. Meconium contains bilirubin. The laxative properties of cholesterol will help him flush out the bilirubin. If the infant isn't fed well, the bilirubin is reabsorbed from the bowels. It then builds up in his body and results in jaundice. Another property of colostrum is that it has a high number of growth factors, such as insulin-like growth factor 1 and insulin-like growth factor 
टू दे आर रिक्वायर्ड फॉर टिश्यू डेवलपमेंट रिपेयर एंड ग्रोथ अनदर ग्रोथ फैक्टर विच इज हाई इन द कोलेस्ट्रम इज वीईजीएफ इट इज कॉल्ड द वैस्क्यूलर एंडोथीलियल ग्रोथ फैक्टर इट प्रमोट्स द ग्रोथ ऑफ न्यू ब्लड वेसल्स The cholesterol is also a major source of epidermal growth factor. It is very important for the normal development of the baby's intestine. It is also essential for repair of the intestine's lining in case of an injury. Thus it provides protection against intestinal disease in newborn babies. For example, necrotizing enterocolitis which is known as nec it is a condition caused due to inflammation of the intestine feeding colostrum also helps to prevent low blood sugar levels in the baby hence colostrum feeding is beneficial for the baby there are a few myths regarding colostrum feeding The first myth is that colostrum should be discarded because it is stale. This is not correct. Colostrum is neither stale nor is it harmful for the baby. On the contrary, it is very essential for the newborn. It should not be discarded even if there is a delay in breastfeeding. Any delay in breastfeeding the baby will cause a delay in cholesterol production for example delay due to poor attachment of the baby to the breast in this case the mother can express her cholesterol and feed it to the baby she can express using press compress and release technique this will prevent unnecessary feeding of prelactal feeds to the baby prelactal feeds are any food given to the newborns before breastfeeding is started for example honey water jaggery herbal paste animal milk formula milk these foods deprive the child of essential nutrients it also increases the risk of infections in newborn babies the second myth is that the quantity of colostrum is less and insufficient some people may believe that is not enough for the baby many women interpret that the breast milk production is inadequate this is not correct the breast milk production is usually in line with the infant's needs infants require very small amounts of milk in the first few days after birth their stomach can hold about 20 ml on day 1 thus the mother should continue feeding frequently for the first few days the infant should be breastfed around 10 to 12 times a day gradually after a few days the milk production will increase on the 5th day the mother's breasts start producing transitional milk it is the second stage of breast milk which is bluish white in color it is produced until 2 weeks after delivery it contains a mixture of both colostrum and regular breast milk after 2 weeks the breast starts producing the mature milk it is more watery as compared to colostrum and transition milk though it is less concentrated it is still nature's perfect food for the baby remember that exclusive breastfeeding should be done up to 6 months when the baby completes 6 months complementary food should be started it should be given along with breastfeeding breastfeeding should be continued till 2 years or beyond the benefits of it last a lifetime for both mother and the infant this brings us to the end of this tutorial thanks for joining